Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome to our final um, session of the Global Health Symposium. Um, for those of you I have not met, my name is Mike Skinechny. I'm the Deputy Director of the Yale Institute for Global Health, and it's my um, real pleasure and honor to moderate our um, final session today, our panel around student experiences um, in global health. Um, I have to say, I was telling Jeremy just a moment ago, he did such a fabulous job with the panel earlier. I hope I you know, keep, keep up with his good uh, interviewing skills, we'll see. Um, uh, but before, before we dive into it, before I describe our programs just a little bit, I, I wanna give uh, each of our colleagues an opportunity just to introduce themselves, a little bit about their background, um, the experiences they took a part of, took part in, um, and then we'll we'll have a larger conversation. So, Charlie. Hi everyone, I'm Charlie uh, Minicucci. I'm a second year MPH student in the Environmental Health Sciences Department. Uh, my involvement with YIGH has included um, the Leadership in Global Health Fellowship, uh, which I was a fellow for last summer. Uh, and also I was a uh, case writing team lead this year and also contributed to case writing last year for the case competition. Yeah. Which we won. Yes. Oh. Which we won <laughs> nationally. <laughs> Thanks in no small part. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Natalia Robelo. I'm from Mexico City. Um, I'm a nutritionist and I came here to Yale to do my MPH in social and behavioral science. I was a fellow at UNICEF for last year, and I participated in the Global Case competition this year, which was very tough, and we didn't get to the finals, but they got to the finals. <laughs> and yeah, um, I've been involved in global health here at Yale um, in multiple ways, um, with colleagues and classmates I met here, and also with faculty here. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about that later, but Yale is a great place for global health, and. It's such a strong platform um, for us to, to grow. Hi everyone, my name is Shruti. Um, I'm a current BS MPH student, so in undergrad, I'm studying cognitive science and I'm about to graduate soon. And then in, um, I'm also, I guess, a first year MPH student in healthcare management. Um, my involvement with YGH was I was also a leadership and health global fellow, um, and I had interned at the International Rescue Committee as a part of that program. <laughs> is this it, okay? It is on. Okay, I'm Lindsay Walker. Um, I am a first year nursing student, um, and I'm in the specialties midwifery and reproductive health nurse practitioner program. Um, I was in the case competition this year at Yale, and we won at the Emory competition as well. <laughs> and my teammate Felicia is also here. So. Well, again, it's great to have uh, all of you uh, uh, on stage here today. Um, before getting into some questions, and I definitely want to make this interactive with the audience as well, uh, maybe just to give a little bit, a little bit of background on both the programs that have been uh, mentioned to kind of set the set the stage. Um, first, the Global Health Case Competition, which has kind of an interesting history here at Yale. Um, I think it was about 10 to maybe a dozen years ago, um, students here actually at the uh, School of Public Health were interested in creating a competition where student teams um, could essentially be given a case, uh, develop a strategy, um, uh, um, and then if they won that competition, go down to the Emory International Global Health Case Competition, which started, I want to say, 15 to 20 years ago. Um, so literally this group of students went to, around to different departments uh, uh, here at Yale, and we ran that program for a couple of years. Um, then with the founding of the Institute for Global Health, there was a lot of interest in re-energizing that. So for the past four years now, we have uh, hosted the case competition, but we've kept the, the main elements from when we first started uh, when that program first started many years ago. So while we manage and kind of oversee the competition, it is really a student-run effort. I think that's one of the really great features of the program. So we have a whole student planning committee 
We have a case writing uh, committee, and they really do all of the organizing. So when I say that, there is the development of the case, working with faculty on the, ca on the case. There's developing the whole event itself, which we host in February, um, where I think it was 30, 40 students all together this past February uh, that participated. Um, and the, the award, the winning team, gets to go to the Emory uh, uh, case competition, which is usually the end of spring break. And so I guess I'll just, maybe I, should I say it again, that we were the winning team uh, again um, in the past, which, was, which I think is, is incredibly notable because it's been around for many, many years. Um, and I can remember when the first team went, um, the team went and other schools were bringing like coaches and all, I mean, it was like, like professional teams were going to this competition. So for Yale to win, um, come in first place two out of three years, I think is a pretty significant achievement. So, uh, so congratulations uh, to you all on that. So um, in addition to the case competition now, it would be five years ago, we also started a program called the Leadership uh, in Global Health Fellowship Program. Uh, our, the idea was to try to develop partnerships and um, curate specific internship opportunities for Yale students and trainees. So not just students here at the School of Public Health, but really across the campus where they could work um, for um, very large kind of major global health organizations. Um, all of these internships essentially have a kind of a policy focus to them. Um, working with the Undergraduate Global Health Studies Program and also the Career Services team here at the School of Public Health. We work to provide funding for these opportunities. And we also try to create a cohort experience um, uh, for the fellows where we have uh, an opening orientation in May. We stay connected um, with the students throughout the summer. And then at the end of the experience, we, have a, we, we kind of have a book-ending event to reflect on uh, the experience over the summer. Last summer, we had 12 students in total uh, working at organizations um, including UNICEF, the World Bank, Gavi, and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. So those are the two signature programs that we launched to really try to um, enhance the different educational experiences um, that Yale students can take advantage of. Um, so here at the School of Public Health, the Global Health Concentration, the Certificate in Global Medicine, the Global Health Track, and School of Nursing, or uh, a little earlier we heard um, about the Global Health Studies Program for, for Yale College undergraduates. So those are the two signature programs. Um, so I'll turn to some questions um, for, for our panel. Um, and looking across the panel, we have case competition, and both some have taken advantage of both, or one or the other. But um, I guess my first question would be, what was the biggest learning that you took away from your experience, whether it be the case competition or the fellowship program? And what was the biggest challenge that you faced in either one of those? So, Charlie, can I ask you to start? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I would say, um, for, for me, I found, because I, because I got to do the case competition um, two years, um, and I was on the, the authorship team, so I was kind of responsible for helping to put together the actual case material, the case document that the teams would then um, very dramatically have revealed to them, and they would have to then compete over the course of two weeks to develop a pitch for it. Um, I think the, the biggest learning experience uh, for me this past year was kind of, you know, what it's like to be in a, kind of a, a global health research leadership role. Um, with a very time-bound, um, uh, fast-paced project. You know, we had to research and, and develop this case over the course of a couple months um, and pour in a lot, of, uh, pour a lot of work to it. But I had never really, I'd always been kind of, uh, in my professional experience, I'd contributed to reports like that, but I had never sort of been the person overseeing sort of a mini version of this. So it was really interesting to kind of have that leadership experience um, and also see, you know, what can happen when you you trust the people working around you and, and you know they're going to do a good job, like just how, um, how uh, high quality the work product can be, even when you kind of have sort of a, a lighter touch than you're used to <laughs> being in the trenches doing the lit review. Um, so that was really exciting. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for me um, with, the, with the case competition is, is uh, 
trying to <laughs> reconcile this kind of uh, this rigor and, and uh, evidence base that you need to produce a solid case, while also trying to be creative and recognize that this is kind of a, a hypothetical experience. And, and how do you kind of, it, it's not often in, <laughs> I, I wish it was more uh, frequent, but it's not often in, in the School of Public Health where I get to be a little creative and do some creative writing. So that was kind of a, a, a bit of a challenge to try to blend those two um, parts of, of myself, but I think it, it was uh, quite rewarding in the end, yeah. Hi, everyone. So for context a little bit, I was a fellow for UNICEF, um, adolescent, and ment adolescent and maternal health. It was more on the mental health side. So I, I would say that the biggest learning takeaway outcome is that having the Yale flag entails a huge responsibility because you get to a place and people trust you. They believe that you are the m most high quality person to be in the role in the position. And so we have to carry this responsibility and honor what we get to learn here. Um, well, I was like my first days at UNICEF, I got to remember like my positionality statement that I got asked to do for a class. And I was like, yeah, I'm not just like from Mexico. I'm not just like nutritionist or this person blah. Now I have the Yale tag in me. And it's like a huge thing to carry. So yeah, I think that that was like a challenge, a learning outcome to say I have to put my best work out there. And if I'm not ready to take some responsibilities, I have to say, no, I cannot do this because I'm not prepared yet. And it was a great experience. I got to lead a qualitative research methodology. We got IRB approval in a month, which is like crazy. I don't know how we did it. And we went to Belize and we did this qualitative study. We, inter we have more than 50 hours of interviews with healthcare providers to understand the mental health setting there. And this is a huge, um, project for the country office there because being at an international uh, organization doesn't mean you're going to have all the resources all the time the settings and the country offices have very different um tools and very different um i would say yeah like even people working there like this office is for people so when you think of unicef you think oh this huge building in new york but if you're there in the office, in the country office, it's four people trying to like manage the situation there and getting to understand what it represents to get placed there and to do something impactful with the money we're given as fellows is, is really important. So yeah, I think that's a great takeaway for me. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shruti again, I guess. Um, when I was a fellow at the International Rescue Committee, um, I think the biggest learning challenge and takeaway that I was um, uh, absorbing in, in that experience was um, the the biases that are involved within sort of quote unquote an empirical research process um given that international the, the international rescue committee has such a diverse body of workers um our my project specifically or, or with our team was um to sort of qualitatively assess um staff well-being and so given this sort of diverse body um of uh workers and staff workers at irsc it was really fascinating to try to see um what mechanisms would be the most effective to try to evaluate mental well-being given how multi uh, multidisciplinary that um, word choice and that experience can even be um, and so taking away from that experience what we ended up doing is we ended up running sort of these informal focus groups and we try to put in sort of scaffolding to make sure that we were kind of emphasizing that this was a collective conversation rather than something that is um, more stigmatized when it comes towards like your way of speech and your way of um, expression um, that I think is still something that I'm curious to keep learning about um, just in terms of really evaluating the biases that exist under common practices that we just so so easily accept when we um, practice public health. Um, with the case competition at Yale and at Emory, I think I learned that I really need to brush up on research skills because um, the Yale competition focused on the Sudanese Chadian border and helping refugees with diabetes um, in Chad. Um, and we quickly learned from trying to do research that there wasn't much out there just because there's not much data and it's 
a rapidly evolving situation where there's just not much we can find. Um, as opposed to the Emory case, which was India, and looking at the relationship between diabetes and TB. And India has so much information, and there are so many government documents, and kind of sifting through all of that information was difficult, and kind of finding what was the most important information we should use. Um, with that, though, I really felt with the intensity of having a week to look at all of this information and really have that pressure to learn as much as possible. I think our team developed an appreciation for what's going on in the countries and all the efforts that um, agencies are making, people are making to address these issues. So it was a really like profound appreciation for what is happening in other parts of the world. So one of the things um, I think that's important to note about the case competition is that the competition here at Yale, you're, you sign up and you're assigned to a team, and then a week or two later, you have to compete, and then obviously the team goes to Emory. So um, for Lindsay, I'd love to hear more about um, you know what led to the team's success. What did you? I mean, because you know, so maybe describe the team backgrounds, what led to your success at Yale and then going down to Emory? Yeah, so I really think that our team worked well together. Each of us has a very different background um, with personal and professional experiences. Um, the ideas that we came up with, um, I had looked into, from the Yale competition, we had feedback from the judges that we really needed to focus on people on the ground. And we had a very product-focused solution at the Yale competition. So we took that feedback, and I was looking into these community health workers in India called accredited social health activists, ASHAs, um, trying to figure out how we could really focus on them for our solution. Um, it's a very... That situation is kind of tied into government and how they're compensating those employees. And it kind of, I didn't really know how to get into using that topic. So then Tamer and Felicia met with Dr. Luke Davis, who's in the back, <laughs> and learned about testing for latent TB with a new um, TB test that is more accurate for individuals who've been given the BCG vaccine. And um, it's this test is less expensive than the blood tests that they use for TB. So they had that idea, and we figured we could combine the idea of working with ASHAs and these new TB tests. And I think having more of a medical side and more of a people-focused side, combining that tailoring it to the solution really helped us. And you were the team leader of the group, right? Yeah. So what, what did, how did you approach being in that leadership role? What did you do within the team? Um, so the Emory competition happened over spring break. <laughs> There were some people who were traveling, some people doing clinical rotations, working on group projects, so we were all very busy. Um, I had decided to stay in New Haven, and I think earlier we were talking about focusing on communities in the US to kind of inform global health. So I had participated in a tour of New Haven looking at um, organizations in New Haven and the work that they're doing through the chaplain's office at Yale, and it was amazing. I feel like that really informed going into this competition. Um, and then I was around, so I helped schedule, I helped do all the administrative work, kind of handing in forms, sending emails, and then I knew that there was gonna be one day where people were flying back into town, we would all be in the same location, so I booked a room for us at the medical library, and we spent, I think, 15 hours in that room. 
Um, and before everyone arrived, I made sure to write on all the whiteboards everything that we had discussed so that when we got together, we'd all be on the same page. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That, that is amazing. <laughs> wow. Well done. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, for our uh, colleagues who participate in the fellowship program, you know, you were working in these large global health and development organizations. So I'd be curious to know, like, you know, going into that, what were your impressions going in? And then what was it like when you were working for these different organizations? You know, I'll give Keep going so just so I have your question. So expe expectations going in and then our experience yeah. as a result. Yeah, I um, so I was uh, placed with the World Bank's Health Nutrition Global uh, Health Nutrition Population Global Practice. Thank you, Maya, for correcting me. Um, <laughs> and it, going into that, I was definitely uh, quite quite intimidated. Um, it was a m bigger and and more uh, well known, flashy organization than one I've ever worked for. So. You know, there's always a little bit of imposter syndrome with everything that happens here, um, but that particularly, I was uh, I was um, quite a bit nervous. Um, but once I was kind of brought up to speed and 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 uh, working on some some projects, you know, I realized that uh, kind of like I was talking about before, if if everyone on the team kind of knows what's happening and is is competent and and trusts one another and and uh, communicates effectively, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of a great work can be done and that that was kind of a an interesting experience for me that you know even though a lot of my team was remote and I was working remote because we had so much faith in one another and, and had good communication um I was just kind of amazed at the pace and the quality of the work that we were able to all produce even though I think I've only met my teammates maybe once or twice in person ever um which was not the experience that I had prior to grad school um in some of my other professional environments so that was really a a, a cool takeaway um, I would say for me, going to UNICEF, I never met my boss, Joanna, until October. So this fellowship started in May, and we never saw each other. Uh, we had barely, like, I think, three Zoom calls over the summer. And she, it's an incredible busy woman. She travels, I think, 60 or 70% of her time. She managed all the mental health initiatives across the world for UNICEF. So... Asking her something felt like very needy on my end. But she said, anything you need, this is, there is this woman in Panama, you can email. There is this guy <laughs> in, in Asia, you can email. I didn't know, even know where. And you can do whatever you think is going to help this country office. So we were given like this huge map to do anything we wanted. And I've never been in this position in my life. And I remember having a chat with, with the mental health specialist for uh, UNICEF Latin America. And she was like, well, if you want to do something, I'm going to Colombia Friday. This was a Tuesday. If you want to come, we need people. So I booked a flight. I was in Colombia. And we were doing this training for mental health. And there something clicked in my head. And I was like, this is what I'm so scared of global health. And this is the richness of this, of this field. Because there is so many resources, everything's so urgent, everything's so fast, everyone's in doing so many things. So we really need to ground ourselves, and I say this to myself, I really need to ground myself in what I want to put out there. And even though there is this cloud of opportunities flying around, I need to be honest to what I can do, what is in my possibilities, and do that like in an excellent and professional way. So yeah, I think. It's that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, when I was entering in that fellowship program, um, I was a bit confused because I didn't really know how the project could even be possible. And I think I talked to my like advisors and whatnot about this. I was just like, I don't understand how this can get done because it is like a large task to ask a wellness assessment across 27 different sites with people who have like a variety of lived experiences. Um, and I, I was, I think, really skeptical when I came in. And the biggest takeaway or what I learned throughout that journey, again, was just the power of working in a team and the power of like people's different experiences and how it can contribute into the 
mechanisms that you employ. And so one of the examples I thought about was how um, we, like the first thing that we did was just give a very, very brief survey on what um, the uh, staff would appreciate in, in terms of an assess assessment, quote unquote, or like a way to communicate um, what they hope to see. And even within that forum, when we were thinking about what to insert in there, um, one of the sections we were really um, emphasizing on was, again, how do you measure who who's taking the survey? How do you measure con the demographic and the psychographic, right? And so what I was uh, really, really, uh, I guess, interested to see was how everyone's different experience or lived experience shaped you know, a certain category that they wanted to see within a demographic survey, whether um, that be you know, number of years that they've stayed at IRC or it's um, a specific type of experience I had at IRC or something like more common that we see with gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, I thought it was really, really special to see how people's different lived experiences within um, the team I was working in contributed to, you know, the details of how you would measure demographics. Um, yeah. So I have um, one or two more questions, but I, I, I'm going to ask one question, then I want the audience to think about some questions. So that's a heads up to my uh, colleague, my the, the mic runner there. Um, so how did your experiences influence, you know, when you came back to Yale, coursework that you decided to take, or how did it shape how you're thinking about your, uh, what's next after, after Yale? Um, hello again. Uh, I can say, um, my experience over the summer and just in, in engaging with YIGH more broadly through my time here, as I've come back in, or come into this last semester, I sort of, uh, I have a new working definition in my head for what global health means to me, which I think, you know, global health we can define in lots of different ways. It can mean everything and it can mean nothing all at once, um, you know. But for me, I, I found that global health is, really just high stakes, high performance team building. Um, I think that if, if that's kind of the skills that I've been, I've been able to develop here through the, the projects I've participated in and the people I've met and um, some of the programs I've been a part of. So, uh, and I think, you know, as we sort of are trying to transition from uh, maybe a, a, a not so um, tasteful legacy of what global health might have meant to people of the past and kind of tra transitioning into this future and kind of recognizing the space that we occupy and, and kind of our responsibilities as global health leaders for the future. I just think it's it's really valuable for me, you know, someone who aspires to be one of those leaders in global health of the future, kind of recognizing that, you know, building teams is going to basically be what, what, it, what it's all about, you know, and that means recognizing my own limitations, um, my own mandate, what I can and can't bring to the table, um, and knowing how to work well and effectively with people from all over the world uh, with all different backgrounds and all different lived experiences, um, sort of elevating them and, and um, putting our best foot forward all together. Um, so in terms of how that's kind of informed decisions I made in the, the end of my MPH, um, I'm taking a, a, I can't remember the name of the class, it's very long, um, Global Health Impact Evaluation, I think. I'll put it that way. Um, Evaluating global health uh, policies and programs, uh, which is something that I never would have thought about. Even it, I would have scrolled through the curriculum and just like skipped right past that one <laughs> last year because it's an economics class, and I have somehow made it to uh, age 27 without ever taking a single economics class in my entire life, not even macro, micro in, in college. Um, so I was a little nervous going into that, but it's actually been a really interesting skills-based class um, that I highly recommend any MPH students in here um, investigate because uh, you'll come out of that class with some, some pretty valuable skills. Um, for me, I would say how my fellowship shaped my future. I always knew I wanted to work for UNICEF. So placed with UNICEF, I was like, oh my god, yes. And then now that I'm out of the almost out of the program, there is like these opportunities about being a consultant for a bigger project in the future, or like collaborating with other people, which are um, opportunities I wouldn't have if, if I hadn't been placed as a fellow. And that's something that, it has like a bittersweet taste for me, because it, for me it demonstrates that if you get this one opportunity, then you're gonna get the next and the next, and those that are left behind f for their first opportunity, it might 
be harder for them to actually get into these positions. Um, but yeah, that's something, another talk for another day. <laughs> but I, I would say that courses I took, um, Dr. Luke Davies course on implementation science, I would say that's one of the most impactful courses I've taken here at Yale. I got to understand how it's not about the outcome, but how you do the things and what you measure in the way that matters a lot more. I am um, Dr. Raphael, global health concentration. Um, the introduction course was so relevant for me. And then I'm also taking the maternal child health promotion track and I got to take that course after. And I got to understand that there is a huge link about everything we do here in the US with how it gets done outside the US. And all of those courses are here at Yale. So I don't know, There's it was very impactful getting to see what I needed to learn more. Um, and the last class I will mention is like cost effectiveness analysis because there's all these tools that we don't, they don't teach these back home, like where I'm from in Mexico, you don't get to learn cost effectiveness analysis. So I feel very honored to get the chance to learn from these experts in the field to get to do this cost effectiveness analysis myself in the future, either for the organizations I'm working for or back home. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It's just it's always like a surprise. I, know. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, so. For me, one of the biggest takeaways that I was uh, having while at the IRC was sort of this like. Um, tension between needing this consistent, thorough research, but also this demand for innovation and this demand for change. Um, and before coming to the IRC, a lot of my background was just working on as like a research assistant in behavioral health, like integrative uh, integrative medicine interventions. And so there, it's just constantly like baby steps, like take every research step that you can, don't miss anything. And then coming to the IRC, there's there was this like limited timeline of like a few, not a few weeks, like eight to 10 weeks that we were doing the internship and you needed to have some sort of tangible outcome or recommendation that you can give at the end of it. And so being able to kind of combat that tension of, okay, what are intentional baby steps that you can take with research, but it doesn't have to be so, so blown out and extravagant as like, per se, like an eight week mindfulness intervention would be or something like that. Um, and so that was something that I really took away was just how can you do something that's still effective, that's still intentional, um, but a little bit more uh, time time sensitive per se. And so um, as, so, um, uh, at Yale College, I'm in the Global Health Studies program as well. And one of the projects that I worked on my senior capstone was actually about um, the importance of arts in humanitarian uh, workers and the way in which you can actually um, co like it sort of incentivize communities to employ arts-based uh, well-being interventions. And so a lot of that kind of coincided with some of the feedback that we were actually getting at the IRC, which was that, yes, we want space to, um, you know, devote towards our well-being, but not maybe say in like a uh, and like mindfulness-based stress reduction intervention, something more like arts, where it's more tangible, it's more um, accessible, and you can relate to it a lot easier. Um, so that was kind of a direct pipeline that I, that I was kind of translating my ideas in. And when I was going through those research processes um, as a part of my capstone project, this mentality of intentional baby steps, but um, not so, like not I don't know, kind of over devoting your time where you're almost taking away from the effectiveness of your work um, was an uh, interesting thing that I'm continuing to learn, I think, from the internship and then through my capstone project. Um, so one solid piece that I will take from the case competition is um, next year when I enter my specialty year in midwifery and reproductive health, I want to apply for the global health track at the School of Nursing. Um, and also participating in the case competition prompted me to reach out to a midwife who now works with MSF. That's something that I've thought about previously and I think after doing this, especially with the um, Sudan Chad case, um, that's something that I will look to later on in life as I gain more experience. Um, so yeah, this was kind of an inspirational experience for me to kind of solidify those goals. So thank you for those great uh, reflections. I'll turn it to the, oh, <laughs> right away, wow. It's good, it's good to prime it right in advance. Yeah, right there, all right. Okay, thank 
Thank you. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah. So thank you all. This is so nice to hear from you. Um, I have the privilege of being able to teach global health. I actually this year teach the intro undergrad global health class, and I'll be teaching that again next year. And I also get to teach a capstone for Masters of Public Health students, so it's a really nice book ending. And as I listen to you talk about your experiences, your interests, how they've evolved, and how you are at the threshold of the next steps for yourselves professionally, I am trying to figure out when and how best to teach students not just the topics, but some of these deep and hard issues about privilege and neocolonialism and decolonizing. You talked about being scared of global health, and I feel scared too. I mean, I also do work with partners. So I wonder if you can reflect on how you've learned those things, how you wish you would have learned those things. How do we do that from within this incredibly privileged environment where we are? For those of us who are teaching and trying to think about how to get that right, and just before you answer, I'll say, the part that worries me is scaring off the ones who should be doing the work by talking about the deep structural inequities and the colonialism and neocolonialism. Like, you don't want to push away the folks who can handle it, but you also want them to know. So anyway, I just any thoughts you have, I would really welcome. Yeah, sorry. It does not have to be in any sort of order. So, Shruti, please. <laughs> sorry, I jumped at this one because this is something that, like, I, I think I thought a lot about with a, sort of my interest. So, I'll give a little bit kind of a backstory. Um, so, one of my interests has been just how you can use the framework of Bharatanatyam or Indian classical dance as a means of well being. Um, and so, a lot of my time during your college was just trying to think about how can you use this as an effective integrative medicine um, intervention. And then, as I kind of did more and more data, on it though, the more and more I realized how much of a deeply troubled past the art form has with um, like neocolonial forces. And so that kind of it honestly broke me as I was learning more. And it got definitely to a point where as I was building it out, um, I, I just like stopped. I just stopped working on everything because I was like, I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, this art form, the context is, is that um, when India, uh, so Bharatanatyam started off as something called Sadhiratam. It was sort of this art form as um, a way to give women a form of agency over their identity, specifically their sexual identity. And um, when uh, India was colonized, it was prohibited and it was um, labeled and misconstrued um, as an art form. And essentially, the dancers were then labeled as people that were um, impure, and the culture was then impure. And so as um, India kind of liberated itself, they framed Sadhiratam then as sort of this expression of culture, but kind of stripped it from their original practitioners, and then labeled the practitioners as the problem. And so that has ties to the caste system, and it was kind of taken away and given to these upper caste Hindu women who then said, we are pure, we can you know, purify this art form. And that is essentially what Bharatanatyam is today. It's just a completely misconstrued version of what Sadhiratam was. And so kind of taking that in as someone who learned Bharatanatyam since the age of four, and obviously when I was four, I didn't know the history. I was just being sent to dance class, um, was something that was so incredibly hard to grapple with. And one of the things that was really helpful that one of my mentors told me that I kind of take away with me is like, you can't run away from neocolonial forces. They're everywhere. And I think um, it kind of instilling that in people as they're working in global health is probably the most important mentality. I think when I first learned about it, I was just like, oh my gosh, I have to quit dance. I have to like dissolve everything that I have with dance. And then it took my mentor being like, sure, maybe that's not the solution here. Maybe you don't walk away from your like passion in life. Um, and instead, his, his mentality of you can't run away from neocolonial forces. So how can you work within it? And how can you re frame your actions so that it can be helpful um, to the best of its ability, I guess, like sort of this net positive mentality is how he kind of reframed it. And I thought that was helpful. Um, so I thought I would just share that. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. <laughs> yeah. I, I can answer that a little bit too. <laughs> Um, so one of my favorite classes in my undergrad was a childbirth and culture class. It was cross-listed with anthropology and gender studies. Um, so that was kind of an introduction to power structures within the realm of childbirth and 
than exploring indigenous cultures across the world. Um, so my thought is maybe there's an interdepartmental aspect of it that could be incorporated. Um, and also, I think empathy is really important. If there's a way you can um, inject lived experiences, stories, as ways of teaching people about global health, I think that's a very powerful way to allow students to empathize with different experiences and really learn from that. If you can't go to the country itself or go somewhere and live there, you can listen to people's stories. Hello. Yeah. It is heartwarming and energizing to see these young people do such amazing work. So congratulations. Uh, I have a question for Shruti. Uh, uh, I wonder if this group is aware that DOTS, uh, Directly Observed Therapy, developed from studies at Chennai, then Madras, uh, and that's where the whole concept originated from. But my question is about that limited time that you had to analyze the data and documents in India. And India is going very fast towards electronic records, uh, use of the internet, uh, pretty high on the electronic pathway. And I wonder if there are mechanisms available to analyze that data using that, the electronic infrastructure, and maybe programs, maybe AI, to do the job much easier for you so that you can have effective output in a limited amount of time. So I think this I think this is referring to the case um, at Emory, uh, the case competition with uh, TB and diabetes in India. Um, it's hard. There's so much information. It was hard to find everything. Um, for our the research that we had, we found apps that are used by the government. Um, there's an app called the Nikshe. Or it's a web-based platform, but it's also an app. Nikshe is used to um, track treatment initiation for TB, um, as well as other other health education aspects. Uh, we also found another app called Nikshe Setu, which is mainly patient-facing and is used for education. It's used for health workers to communicate with um, patients in the community and educate on TB. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but there, we could have done a lot more research on looking at all of the advancements that India has made as far as AI and technology. Setu means bridge. So uh, Nikshe, I'm understanding, is NIC, National Informatics Center, which may have spearheaded this. And Setu, bridge means that's a bridge between uh, the providers and the patients. So uh, that's an interesting observation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, thank you all. This is really remarkable work that you've all done. Um, there was a really, uh, I think, Salient comment, I forget your name, Catalina. Uh, Natalia. Natalia. Um, earlier about like the, um, the power of holding that Yale flag or wearing that Yale hat. Um, and I, as a YIGH insider, so to speak, um, I, wa I want to ask you about how we can do better. And I think about, so like something that's, um, I've worried about for a while about the case competition is that there are no members from the countries or the agencies that you're doing this hypothetical competition to solve a problem for that are involved in the competition itself. And I, I don't know the answer, but you've, all, you've experienced this uh, at Yale and at the national scale. And I wonder, are there ways to do better by engaging um, folks from other places who might 
be partners in solving these really complex cases? And that's a hard question to answer. I know these are very, you have a very short amount of time and they're not, the, the system isn't built to, to really allow that engagement, at least over a long period of time. But I wonder if you have any creative thoughts or if you've struggled with that question yourself. I think that what you're saying is, yeah, it, it resonates so much with what I've been reflecting on. And from what Charlie's mentioned about building very capable teams in a very fast phase. And just very quickly, like I got the opportunity to be a consultant for a World Bank project in India for Primary Hulker. And I remember being there. I was a consultant for three months and I didn't have the context of the country, right? I couldn't even name like the entire ASHA structure. And I felt very lost. And something that helped me out so much was I became friends with the local focal point um, there. And then building this relationship across the one and a half years that we worked on this project, I was based here. She was there conducting the qualitative research. And then we will analyze the work together. If I didn't have her as an Indian born nurse that's doing primary health care work, this would have been such a biased research because I don't have the context and I don't have the research to go there, and neither the experience. So I think that what you're saying is actually very, yeah, it, it should, I think we should aim to build relationships with the people in country in the way that we can. So if we're building a case competition, why don't we like try to connect with the university there in the country and understand from their perspective. And this happens actually for, for courses like the global health uh, intro class. I know students that make their cases sometimes have like interviews with people that have worked in the country to sort of understand the local, um, the locals perspectives. However, if this was incentivized by the Institute, I think it would be a very nice add up to, to everything. Yeah. Um. That's a really great question and something, yeah, I, I definitely feel like I've grappled with um, myself. And I guess I, I don't have a solution, but um, I think in, in, so for my um, thesis research, I worked with a um, team of clinicians in, in Bhutan um, working on an in, indoor air pollution uh, kind of solution for a community of uh, nomadic people who were kind of missed by some of the rural electrification projects that had been going on in the country for uh, the previous two decades. Um, and, you know, the the, re the way that I happened upon that project is um, I just, I kind of got in touch with the chief medical officer there and I said, well, so... What do you want to do? I have, uh, I have the Yale name. I have like I have the ability to apply for these grant funds. Like they're not huge, but you know, and I have a summer, so I can. That's that's what I can bring to the table. What do you want to do? Um, and he said, Well, this is something that we aren't able to deal with because we don't have the bandwidth, but it's really important to me. Um, this is a community that is underserved by, uh, you know, our our. Uh, medical services and let's let's try and do something there and I that was great and you know I think I came out at the right way asking you know asking the right questions but you know at, at the end of that project you know I'm sort of looking back and realizing well you know I it, it's I was fortunate to be in the position of a graduate student who was able to kind of put my thesis research into it and that was you know that's what I was able to get out of it but you know the the tenure track professors with the six and seven figure grant funding. They they probably don't have the the luxury of always, you know, just doing a small, you know, diligent uh, community uh, exposure evaluation. You know, it's that might not be super high quality data. Or, you know, something that you can publish in a, in a high impact journal. So, um, yeah, I know that's not really an answer, but it's something I'm still still re wrestling with myself. But I do think that that master students have have a role to play there in that kind of in between space. Yeah. Just say you should never undermine the power of the small student-driven project because it drives everything. Okay, so, so the question that I have, uh, especially for those of you who may have gone to college, for example, or grew up in a lower-income country, is related to the slide, the data that Madhupai showed today, that uh, the all the global health academic programs are concentrated in a, academic programs are concentrated in a handful of academic institutions in high-income countries. 
So when I go to Mexico, when I go to uh, you know countries around the world, lower income countries, and I start talking about global health, it's it's very confusing uh, to people. What what does that mean? What it does? What is that? They don't have uh, those uh, those programs. It is very much a colonial legacy because those programs were called international health in the past. And it was the message that is us high income countries, you know, in a very patronizing way, having to be the ones telling you what to do to improve the conditions in your lives and, and your countries. So now that we have switched the framework, many of us, to global, and, you know, global is global. Do you think that th there is a way to establish global health academic programs in academic institutions in lower income countries? Is it worth doing that? And what would they look like? What, what would they do that may be different from the ones that we have in high income countries? So for me, I remember a lot last year, There, we had a, a seminar, it was like global health is local health. And for me, what that, after reflecting what it meant, is like, how can me, de I don't like the development term, but country that's in a development phase or has still to develop some of its like essential needs, like healthcare or the healthcare system or educational system, how, um, how can we engage with those more experienced countries to better serve our needs. So for me, it's like, yes, of course, um, countries in development stages should have these programs. So the officials and the people that serve in these countries, and I, this, oh, you made us read this book, The his, Principles of Global Health, or The History of Global Health from Packard, I think. And it was such an impactful book for me because it mentioned like, it told all these stories about like the yellow fever and how the officials from the Casey Foundation will go and like spray and like all these things that happened. And then he mentioned like the empowerment of actual people in places is what actually solved these issues because they had the local knowledge. And so it just, makes much more sense that people in these countries are learning these skills and they're le learning all like all that we learn here and get to integrate it with their local knowledge to actually make impactful change. So yeah. You want to say something? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll just talk about Bhutan again because that's all I've done for the last two years. So <laughs> um, I think my experience um, with Bhutan, you know, they just launched their first MBBS program. Um, and the next thing on the docket for their uh, medical university was an MPH. And that, I think, was very intentional um, because, you know, I, and if I'm understanding your question correctly, Professor, it's that, you know, should we invest time kind of building these educational opportunities um, in the places where they're needed, or should we invest in bringing people to the, is that, am I having that correctly? Right. Best lower income countries receive the funding for them themselves to yes. invest, not us. Going right. there to do it, do it right. for them, but should themselves be empowered to to do it? Yeah, yeah, I think I think so, and I think like Natalia was saying, it just um, on a fundamental basis, like I've never received care from a basic health unit, or like I, I don't understand a lot of how health systems work in other countries, just because I never, gr I didn't grow up from a neonate to today having having you know an understanding of how those systems work, you know how referral systems work, how. Uh, you know, r remote and rural healthcare uh, is accessed. So I think it's just from a basic, you know, systems level, kind of understanding the operational space. Um, I think it's, it definitely behooves uh, countries to invest in that. Um, obviously, I think we have a role to invest as well with a big institutions. And I the, think part of what I'm hearing is that they could play a very big role in training you <laughs> as well. And, yeah, and, and you could learn a lot from absolutely. the healthcare systems. And, the, and I, I just want to, to bring up that they don't call it that way. But for example, Brazil led the South to South movement for the, you know, the production and delivery of free antiretroviral treatments for people with HIV. And also they 
play a massive role building capacity in Mozambique and Angola, the Portuguese speaking uh, countries. And there are a lot uh, of these programs, Natalia, in, in among Latin American countries. They just don't, ha don't get recognized. They just don't matter because they are not in uh, high income countries. But the work they are doing is, is incredibly uh, impactful, but they don't call them global health programs. They, they don't have academic programs as such. It's, it's, it's something that could be formalized much more. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for sharing your reflections, your experiences. I'm so inspired. And uh, some of us will be fellows this summer for the Leadership in Global Health program. I'll be at the Global Fund in Geneva. Very excited. So I would like to ask you, um, what advice do you have for us this summer? Is there something that you wish you knew before you started the program or something that you wish you approached differently? What a great final question. <laughs> it's like I set that up in some way. I don't know. Very quickly, I'll just say other fellows are your friends. And I hope to work with Charlie, I hope to work with Tarini, I hope to work with you in the future, because I know what you're doing. Josian. So I think like going to your friends and asking them like, how did you solve this issue? Um, have you struggled through this yourself? There is so much like in the networks that we're building here that we maybe take for granted. And we were told this during the introduction and I think Oh, Dr. Burr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Burr. I, I always say by bad his name. I'm so sorry. But he's great. He's amazing. And yeah, he's such a great resource at sh showing you Dr. Burr. David Burr. David Burr. David Burr. Yeah. I, yeah, David Burr. He's amazing. He's in the psychology department. And you'll have this workshop, and he'll go all about um, don't fear um, of speaking up, um, say what you feel go to your other um, pals and talk about it and come to the reflections and you know and there it's so it's so true because now that i'm about to graduate i don't i don't see others as my competition sometimes we get the sense that oh my god there is this opportunity i don't want others like sometimes i feel people don't want me to see like their screens because they I might like steal their idea on linkedin you know <laughs> i'm like but i don't see others as like competition and i think you should not see others in the same placement as yourself or other fellows as like i want to like like be more or do it better um i think they're your friends and they're here to grow with you so yeah that Um, I mean, I agree with that for sure. <laughs> that I think um, <laughs> um, coming into it, I think I was like, there were two other undergrads at the time, so I didn't know most of the people in the program. Um, and so I think just talking to, to the fellows and learning from their experiences before the program, in, during the program, was just really, really helpful. Um, I had one specific friend that I think we talked um, like throughout the time, like just texted and like we'll talk on the phone about our own experiences, um, just challenges and ups and downs throughout the fellowship program. I think that really helped, mostly because most of the work that we had done for IRC was entirely virtual, and so there wasn't too much of an in-person component. And I thought that was a bit challenging just to like um, you know maintain sort of. Um, your own well-being throughout the program and so having the fellows there and their, them like sharing their own experiences with you even if they're like really really far away in Geneva <laughs> was um, a beneficial part of the program I think. Don't, don't panic. You're not there to save the world. Um, uh, you're, you might not be everybody's first priority <laughs> um, and that's okay. Um, and I feel like I found that in kind of the academic environment, I'm, I feel sort of encouraged to speak and sh dis display my knowledge and show what I can do because that's kind of how we get evaluated here. But um, just focus on on listening while you're there. I think the most important thing that I did in my internship was just kind of learn as much as I could. Just kind of go to the meetings, listen, you know, sit on on whatever you can, be a wallflower um, because that's uh, extraordinary access that you'll have. Yeah, you learn a lot that way. Well, thank you all for the great advice and for a great final panel here to our symposium. And I guess just to, to close out the event, I just want to echo Michael's comments from 
earlier just to say some thank yous to the conference and events team. I think Shannon is probably outside, but uh, they've been great um, to the broadcast team, handling all the AV and everything like that. Really appreciate all your help. And certainly to the YAGH team as well. Um, why don't we have, a, I, I like that everyone's standing up, for, including you, Professor Capello. Come on, Christina. Oh, oh come on, Jerry. Come on. It was a, you know, this, it was a real, a real team effort, including our, our, our student fellow.